So, good afternoon. Um, this is always a very, very tough slot to do straight after lunch. So, it's a beautiful day outside, which I shouldn't remind you. Um, you've all just been fed, and you've already sat through several hours of presentations. So, um, now it's my turn. Uh, so, uh, what I wanted to do was I'm going to spend um, the, next, the next sort of, I don't know, the next little period of time, and I wanted to share a few things with you. I was lucky enough to present here last year, and... Um, Last year, I, I told a little story about um, my mother's adoption of IT. Um, and for, if there were one or two of you here, you may remember the story. I decided when my mother reached 68 to buy her her first ever computer. Um, and I bought it for her because she was bored. She'd retired and she had little to do and a lot of time on her hands. And I have been on this painful journey for the last four years of being my mother's support desk. Uh, and it's been, it's been fantastic because it's had some real highs. She's now an eBay user, a PayPal user. She now tweets. She's on Facebook. She's all sorts of things. And it's had some real lows because when she joined Facebook, she started posting photographs that I wish even my family hadn't seen of me. And now the world gets to enjoy them. Um, I told this story recently at an event. And in fact, I was at the same event yesterday, so it was a year later. And um, when I told this story about my mum's journey through IT, and by the way, I tell the story because it's been fascinating for me because I've seen somebody's journey into IT from never having used it to being quite proficient over a really short period of time. For me, it's been a 20, 30-year journey. For my mother, it was th literally three to four years. But when I told the story, I walked off stage afterwards and a guy spotted me over because I was out by our stand and he came wandering straight over to me. He made a beeline for me. And as he got towards me, he said, um, my mother's two years ahead of yours, <laughs> which, uh, now I didn't know it was a competition, but, um, but I said, oh, so how's that then? How, how, how's your mother two years ahead? And he said, um, I too introduced my mother to technology at an older age, and she's been getting used to it. He said, and a few weeks ago, she emailed me a couple of digital photographs of my wedding. And I said, oh, that's very sweet. And he said, and I opened them, I looked at them, and I sent her a note back saying, I'm not sure why you've sent me these, because I already have them. He said, and I got an email back from my mother a few minutes later, and it just said, look closer. So he said, I opened up one of the emails again, and he said, and I looked more closely at it, and he said, and in the front row, he said, was Granny. I said, oh, that's sweet. He said, not really. He said, Granny died two years before I got married. <laughs> he said, Mum had worked out Photoshop and had Photoshopped her into the wedding photographs, <laughs> which I thought was a remarkable achievement. And I sort of thought afterwards, is that, is that good or is that kind of creepy? <laughs> but um, so, so it was, but I, I, love, I love it because it gives, me, it gives me a chance to kind of step back and, and see how rapidly things change. Because as when we're involved in IT, when you're, when you're actually involved in something, the pace feels quite slow. And when things just evolve around you, you actually don't see how rapidly those things have actually changed. Um, one of the things I was at recently, I'm a huge Formula One fan, and I get to speak at different events, and sometimes I get to speak at Formula One events. And again, I've not really noticed the evolution of Formula One cars. You kind of see them, they come out each year, and they look slightly different. But then when you actually step back and you look at 10 or 12 years of Formula One cars and you see just how radically different what we had was back 10 or 12 years ago and where we are now, it suddenly brings it into context just how much things have changed. And I kind of think that's where we're at at the moment. I think we've already seen quite a large amount of change. Um, we keep talking about cloud. We keep talking about all of these, these names. Um, and I think... If we st I think if we were to step back you know, in a year or so's time and kind of look at how much stuff has changed, I think we'd be incredibly surprised. I think while we're involved in it and while it's happening around us, it's, it's evolutionary. It's not, it doesn't have the impact. It doesn't feel like it has the impact. So I want to talk a little bit about how I see IT changing. I spend all of my time meeting with people in different countries and in different companies. In the last two years, I've done... 56 unique countries, and I've been back to some of those more than once. So I've got a fairly varied view from lots of people that I talk to in lots of different areas. And this is what I'm starting to see come out. And whether you have the same titles, it doesn't really matter. The, the, the idea really here is what the categories are. And the first one is what I call commodity IT, which is that increasingly I'm talking to people and they're starting to really look at what does and does not create value for the company. 
and they're being quite brutal about this. And, and it doesn't just have to be an application. It can be, you know, when you take IT as a whole and look at IT and say, what is it that we do and does it create value? People are making these decisions and are starting to at least group them together. Because once you start to group them together, you can then make decisions about what you should do with them. This is where cloud has had a big impact already. Because people are looking at things like email. If I gave you 100 more people to run your email system, would it necessarily create lots more value from it? Not really. So it's a kind of a good candidate for, for moving across into this, this commodity IT area. And at that point, you can start making decisions. And the decision isn't get rid of it. That could be one of the decisions. Once you've kind of identified something that doesn't necessarily add a lot of value, you, your decision becomes, do we get rid of it? which is probably legislative governance. It's probably down to reasons as to can you. If you can't, then you start making decisions, well, how do we run it? If it doesn't have the ability to create significant value, then maybe we need to consider how we deal with it in a different way. Maybe we need to treat it as more of a utility, build infrastructures that are far more automated, far more efficient, you know, far less kind of time consuming than what we have today. By doing that, it allows us to start looking at, well, where is there the ability to create value? What are the things that, if we did them better, would actually create value for the business? It was interesting for me the other week. I met with um, Regis, who um, all of you will know, and many of you probably have Regis facilities. I had no idea, but you can go to a Regis facility now if you're a new customer, and you can sign up and say how much floor space you want, how many desks you want, how many phones you want, what domain name you want, how many email accounts you want, how much internet bandwidth you want, and you just tick them all off. Because Regis have recognized that those are things that your business has to have, but they're not things that, you're, that potentially create you any money. Because they want you to be focused on the stuff that you are actually in business to do. So they take all of that stuff away from you, and they say, focus on what actually is your core business, what actually has the potential to create value for you. And then the final one fascinates me. And I've titled this presentation a couple of times, it's just a jump to the left, because we're very good at doing this. And we've been doing this for very, very many years, but what's over here is absolutely fascinating for me. I've told this story before, and I, and I'll, but I'll tell it again, because it, it, it's just a wonderful example of what IT could do. How many of you tweet? Anyone in the room? One, two, three, yeah. So I was going to say this table of young people over here, the millennials as they're called nowadays, <laughs> their hands went up and everyone else kind of... <sighs> so I am, a, I am an unwilling participant of Twitter, of Twitter, sorry, of tweeting. Um, I'm trying to, it's alien to me. I haven't grown up with it. It's something I've kind of tried to get comfortable with. Um, and it's 140 characters that after receiving them, my life is no better whatsoever. Um, but we like to do it, and we kind of, and I'm trying to think it's useful. Now, there's something called the Twitter Firehose that many of you may have heard of, which is a subscription you can buy from Twitter. If you pay for the, the Twitter Firehose, they will stream you every single tweet that gets posted every single second of every single day. They broke their record four weeks ago, and that was 500 million tweets per day. Now, for me, one tweet seems like a little bit of a waste of time. 500 million of them seems like a massive, massive amount of useless information. But I would contest, if you create 500 million of anything, there's value in there somewhere. And what we're starting to find is people are starting to look into this and saying, actually, there is value, but who's going to get it? Who, whose role is it to start looking at these things and trying to work out where we get the value from? When the airplane went down in the Hudson River, where was the first place we found out about it? got tweeted. When we had the earthquakes in Port-au-Prince, where was the first place we found out about it? It got tweeted. Social media, Twitter, and other, and other of these types of feeds are becoming early warning signs. And companies are now starting to look at them and saying, can we use these as early warning indicators in order for us to make better decisions? HMV, as I, many of you will know, went bust fairly recently. And they're just sort of coming out the other side. Hopefully, they're going to keep some of the business open. HMV were huge Twitter users. In fact, they had all of their marketing team use Twitter quite profusely. When they called the marketing team into the office to sack them all, they made the one mistake because the people who called them in to sack them were not the millennials. They didn't think to take the Twitter account off them. 
they just proceeded to fire them all. Well, of course, they all had bring your own device and they all had Twitter access. So as they were being fired, they were tweeting, just been called into a meeting and have been fired. Now, as an investor into HMV, I'd quite like to know that because if I had quite a significant exposure to HMV stock or shares, that's an early warning indicator. And that's where these things start to get interesting. And that, for me, is the evolution of IT. Who is going to do this? Because if you look at the investment and where the opportunity is for value, as you take the step to the left, the opportunity to create value for the business goes up exponentially. If you look at where the money is spent today, it looks like that. We spend, on average, 63% of the money that is given to IT on stuff that adds absolutely no value whatsoever. We spend 21% on simply keeping pace with the growth of information, the growth of systems, the growth of the organization, and how we need to expand our systems to cope with it. And we spend 16% on using money that goes into IT on anything that has the potential to actually really add value. That slide for me is the slide that's being passed around the boardroom at the moment. That is the discussion that's being had between the CFO, the CIO, the CMO at the moment. And they're looking at it and they're thinking, this is a very bad picture. So something has to change. And this is what the evolution's gonna be. And it's kind of interesting when you, when you start to, to, to look at this and you start thinking, well, how do we change? I think more and more of IT is becoming more and more of a utility. And, and I think whether we like that or not, um, th the fact is we have to accept that, that there's more and more of what we've traditionally done, which actually anyone could do. Um, and actually, sometimes we are not the best people to do it. And I was starting to think that if you start to think of um, IT as more of a utility, you know, how, how does that work? How does that play out? How does IT change? I was on a... I was on a plane coming back from one of my many journeys fairly recently. Now, I don't know how any of you are. When I get on a plane, I want to sit in the corner with my headphones on, and I just want to ignore everybody and have an hour's flight to the other end. Um, and I'm usually lucky that that usually happens. I have a window seat. However, this time, I sat down in my seat, and before I could get my headphones on, a professor from Cambridge came and sat in the seat next to me and proceeded to talk to me. Um, which I wasn't used to, and I didn't really want to talk to him, but he, he did. And for the next half an hour, he explained to me that he was an energy professor. So he was a specialist in oil and gas and electricity, and he spent his time lobbying and working with governments all over the world. And actually, it was quite an interesting half hour. And then he made the biggest mistake of his life. He said to me, what do you do? <laughs> and I said, I'm in IT. And I watched the blood drain out of his face. <laughs> and clearly he was thinking, why me? <laughs> I've got another half an hour flight ahead of me. <laughs> and um, so, but anyway, we got talking and I was thinking, well, how do I talk about IT to a, a professor of Cambridge who's a specialist in energy in a way that's going to make any kind of sense to him? And I started, we started sort of pondering it. And I said, actually, I said, there are some similarities. I said, if you think about gas, I said, gas, we store it somewhere in large containers, we pass it through pipes, and gas in and of itself has absolutely no value until we turn it into something useful at the other end. Either we power something with it, it becomes useful when it's converted into something else. And actually, all of us in this room do not care about anything behind what that something else is. It is simply a utility. Electricity is the same. Electricity has no value whatsoever until it reaches an endpoint, and whatever we can convert it into something else, and whatever we convert it into does have value, and everything behind it is a utility. And for the sake of ease, for him, I said, data's the same. I said, data in and of itself has no real value. We store it in large containers, we pass it over cables, and it's when it reaches the endpoint, whether that's an application, whether that's a device, whatever that might be, we then turn it into something that has value. And he kind of liked that, because he could kind of get that as an analogy. So I decided to stretch the analogy too far. But it kind of worked for me, because when you start thinking in those kind of utility terms, I started thinking, why am I with British Gas? Because think about that. I, I don't know how many options you have over here. How many, how many different companies could you get your gas and electric from? Three, three, three main companies? Now, think about it. The gas is the same. 
It doesn't matter who you buy it from, it's the same gas. You don't magically get better gas because you'd use it to go out from one other company. The electricity is exactly the same. The electricity doesn't become cleaner simply because you choose to buy it from one or another company. You typically choose who your provider is, one, cost. That's typically the first reason. And two, probably service. But you know what? I can actually put up with a level of service that may not be the best if I can get it for the cheapest price. So how do you make a decision as to where you stay? I stay with British Gas because of big data. It's the only reason I stay with British Gas. And the reason I stay with them for big data is because the gas is the same, the pipes are the same, the electricity is the same. All these things are the same. They're utilities. Over time, even what I pay for it would be very, very similar regardless of who I got it from. What they've realized is that the way they can actually differentiate themselves is to do something different, to do something unique. And they give me a website that I can log on to. And when I go onto their website, I can see exactly how much gas I used this year compared to last year. I can do it by week, by month. I can compare my usage to my neighbor and how much he used last week, last year, last month. I can compare it to people in the same street. I can compare it to people who have the same number of bedrooms, the same number of people living in the house, in the same road, city, or country. And I found out I was paying twice as much for my gas as my neighbor was. I was using twice as much gas. So I had a chat with Brian next door and said, why am I using twice as much? And we talked about it. It turns out I had the hot water coming on twice a day. So I switch the hot water off in the afternoon. I have my gas bill, and we still have enough hot water. And I stay with British Gas, not because of the gas, not because of the service, not because of the utility. It is simply a utility. I stay with British Gas because they looked at new opportunities. They looked at what could they do differently from NPower, from Eon, from all these other companies that would ensure that I'd stay with them. And you know what? I'll even pay them a premium for that service because they saved me money. That, I think, is fascinating because a lot of what IT does is going to become much more utilitarian. And at that point, you have to decide what you're going to do with it. The first point is, or the first thing is, do we put it out to the cloud? And that is certainly an option. The second point is, do we build the infrastructures in different ways? If we start to realize that a lot of what we do is much more utility than it's ever been before, how do we build infrastructures to support that? And I would suggest that you start considering these three terms. We have a converged infra... By the way, I've talked for 15 minutes without talking about NetApp. This is my one sales slide. Here. This is why you're seeing the rise of the converged infrastructure, the reason why you're starting to see vendors like ourselves and Cisco combining together and saying, what we can sell you is a converged stack. The best of breed servers with the best of breed network with the best of breed storage all linked together, highly automated, highly efficient. You put that in and then you move your utility applications onto it. It's more efficient than anything else you can buy. It's faster than anything else that you can buy. It requires and can be more consolidated than anything else that you can buy. And once you put stuff onto it, you basically leave it alone. And this is becoming, whether it's FlexPod from us and from Cisco, or whether it's other converged stacks, you're going to see that this is going to be one of the fastest growing sectors of the IT market, as people simply want to say, you know, I just need something for these apps to run on. I want to be able to move more things onto them. This is growing. So that's commodity IT. What about business value IT? We do a lot of work with ING Direct Bank. They were spending all their time, or a huge amount of their time, looking at these things that didn't really create value. They, had a, they have a group called the Bank in the Box group. And the Bank in the Box group has one role. When somebody says we need a copy of the entire banking environment, it's this group's job to create a replica of the banking environment. When we started talking to them about it and said, well, why would that be? They said, well, test, development, pre-production, QA. There's a whole plethora of purposes. We said, how long does that take? They said, once the request comes in, it takes four months for us to create a copy of the banking environment. Four months to create a copy. So when we started talking this through and saying, well, let's look at what you could do differently. Let's look at, at, at technology you could bring to bear if we were to free up more time and put the right technology in place. We put cloning in, which is one of the features that runs on our storage systems. Within two weeks of them putting our storage system in place, they created 400 
copies of the banking environment. They create them instantly, they consume no storage. And what's better than that, the IT department don't even do it themselves. They actually give that capability out to the different groups who need to do it. They have the testers, the developers, the ethical hackers, which I just think is a wonderful term, um, but the ethical hackers, who are the groups that do the penetration testing against the systems, they now use them. The training department. Every different group inside the organization now has the ability to create a copy to use for whatever they want to use. And it's created huge, huge value. And they're now starting to talk to us about a whole bunch of new things because the utility, the commodity side of things, the cost has been reduced. The business value IT has enabled them to secure more funding which means they're starting to look at a whole bunch of new technologies and new projects. And they're looking over here. And I'm going to give you and leave you with an example of where I think this is incredibly interesting, and it's a personal example from NetApp. We've, we're an IT company. We're a storage company. Um, storage doesn't cost us a huge amount because we make it. Um, however, we're still looking at how we can minimize our own usage. About 30% of our applications we've now moved to the cloud. We are a Salesforce.com user. Little, little back story. We spent, we spent two years trying to upgrade our Siebel system from Siebel version 7 to version 8. Siebel version 7 is ancient. Siebel version 8 is just extremely old. Two years we tried to do this project. It was called the V8 Power Up Project, which was so the wrong title for that project. Two years. And we had a new CIO, and she came in and asked the one question that no one had thought to ask. And she said, does this application make us better storage systems? And the project team all looked at each other and went, no. And she said, then let's get rid of it. And we went to Salesforce. And it has not been easy. Moving applications to the cloud to have delivered back to you is by far, <laughs> it is not a simple process. And it is not a straightforward process. But it makes sense. What we then did, because we freed up this time, we freed up this resource, is we then looked at what could we do better. And the first thing we looked at was how do we mine or how do we get better information from auto support? Every week, 600,000 emails come into us from the systems deployed in the field. These are the auto supports that tell us how our systems are behaving, for those of you who have it switched on. We then mine that information looking for trends, looking for potential failures, looking for preventative or proactive warnings that we could give to you. We created, it's over here, uh, a 240 billion record database. 240 billion records inside the database. We couldn't actually query it for anything. In fact, there were queries that we needed to do to look for basic failures. And one of those queries that we were performing used to take four weeks. Four weeks to perform a basic query as to something that we were concerned might be happening. With Hadoop, we've now reduced that to 10 and a half hours. That's IT really delivering value. What we've also been able to do is on the 240 billion record database, we're actually able to perform queries that we simply could not do before. We simply couldn't do them. And we've been able to do all of this because we've addressed a lot of what is a commodity to us. We don't run our own email, by the way. We're a storage company. We don't run our own email systems. We don't run our own Salesforce, our own business systems. That does not make us better storage products. So we've been moving them out. What's interesting for me, and the kind of the message I wanted to, to leave with you, is it's uncomfortable. This move, this step to the left, is uncomfortable. Steve Bezos, who's the um, CEO from Amazon, he said, the problem you have with all of these things is people have a vested interest in staying where they are. People feel very comfortable where they are. People, in fact, I talked with somebody the other day, and he said they've been growing as an organization, and they're finally, the IT department are going to get their own data center, and they're so proud of this data center they're about to build. And he said, and it's a massive waste of money for us, because we don't want it. But he said, they're IT people, they're architects, they're engineers, they want their data center. They've been promised their data center. Their friends who work for big companies have a data center. Um, or as my friend calls them, a museum of past IT decisions, which I quite like. Um, he said, so people have a vested interest not to change. And unfortunately, that kind of thinking is actually severely limiting. And what's more worrying is those people who are afraid to change, those people who are kind of looking at, I can build a data center. By the way, I go back to my first picture. When you look at 63% commodity, the CEO, the CIO, the CFO are looking at this and saying, actually, 
Those people who think they're the most comfortable because they run the big systems, they think they're the specialists, the experts, they're actually the most expensive thing we have. And that's not a good place to be. So it's a kind of a warning and encouragement. Be aware of this because IT is changing and it's being forced to change from above because of the numbers. As IT leaders, I think it's our responsibility to show people how much better the place we could be is than where we are and how it's much more exciting. I can tell you now, the guys who are working on our Hadoop implementation and some of the stuff they're doing, that is far more interesting to them than managing an email system because that's what they were doing before. And we've reskilled them and we've given them new tools, we've given them new opportunities. And that's the thing we have to do. You have to show people why where they could be is so much better than where they are. The story I told when I met with some of you last time and I spoke here before, my mother's four-year journey of through IT was self-propelled. She could see how every time she adopted a new piece of equipment, the iPod, the Kindle, you know, she, she's got the lot, but she could convince herself each time that actually what she could do and where she would be, the environment that she would have would be so much better because of this, that she was happy to leave everything behind. And she's gone through massive change, and I think IT has to. So on that note, we're here in the stand. There's a couple more presentations to go. Love to come and talk to you more about this one, but um, be bold. IT has to evolve, and we are the people that need to make it happen. Thank you very much indeed.